At the end of this meeting, we'll send a link to the survey where you can provide your feedback so we can make these programs even better. And I don't think I have anything else I need to say here. So just some quick introductions of our speakers. Everyone knows Dara. So Dara Richmond, she is a member of Grizzly Peak Cyclist. She also has been managing her social media. Thank you very much. Um, she is a member and also, also she is of course an owner of Dara Sports PT, where she's worked with professional athletes for 15 years. She's a licensed physical therapist and holds a doctorate in physical therapy, Dr. Dara. <laughs> um, she specializes in treating cyclists and working on sports performance and strength for athletes of all levels. We also have John Cheatham. He is from Tempo Endurance Coaching, and he's a um, seasoned cycling coach using a combination of techniques, including the latest technology and data collection to help athletes meet and exceed their goals. His athletes have won international, national, and countless regional titles at all endurance levels. And I will let you guys take it away. Thank you. Thank you, MJ. Um, I'll just start off really quickly and then I will definitely be handing the mic, the virtual mic over to Johnny since he's the guy with the foot models and pelvis and all this cool stuff. Um, yeah, so just a, um, just a quick recap. Um, I know many of you, I see some familiar faces. Hi. Um, Scott, I saw your question. We will get to that. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free to add in the chat box. I added my email as well as Johnny's email if you have other questions. Um, I worked with Johnny for a while. We're both also coaches for Oakland Composite, the mountain bike team, the high school mountain bike team. So um, we work together a lot with the high school kids, um, as well as we work together in Montclair in it, our office. And then we also have an office in Marin where we do a bike fit and PT assessment combination. So a lot of what we do is either a medical fit where we're kind of tweaking and working with the rider on the bike, or maybe they have a neck issue, maybe they have a low back issue. We're kind of just figuring out, putting all the pieces together. together. So, um, and I love working with Johnny, he's amazing. Um, and so just to kind of preface our talk today, we're talking about biomechanics, which is um, somewhat of a convoluted notion. I mean, a lot of what I do specifically in physical therapy is biomechanics. So really when we're talking about that's the study of mechanical laws relating to movement, movement or structure of living organisms. So really when, we, when I think of fitting the bike and we think of all the mechanics of adjusting the stem and adjusting the seat and the floor aft, it's the same thing that I do in physical therapy, right? We're looking at levers. We're looking at your hip and your knee angle. I'm looking at, okay, how does this person squat? Is their squat efficient? Is there some, some impediment to them moving well um, in their squat? And is that then gonna translate to their position on the bike? So that's really when we talk about like putting all the pieces together, you know, the main thing that I like to stress to people um, and John as well, and any good bike fitter is really the heart of this conversation is, you know, getting fit to your bike doesn't mean you just, it's all about the bike, really. We have to look at you, the human first, and make sure that you are moving efficiently, right? You have a, your system is, is there's a good alignment and we're, we're looking at the bigger picture of how you are moving as a person. And then we work on the bike fit, right? It's not just tweaking, the, raising the stem or raising the bars, right? It's like, if you have an issue, um, a lot of times it's really like work on you and don't expect the bike fit to just fix those issues. Um, and the other part of it, I think, from just a PT perspective of working with patients of, of all ages, whether it's high school kids, whether it's you know, 80 year old, 70 year old riders who wanna be riding their bike is really, it's, not, it's never too late, right? And I like to tell people that because I think people, oh, my neck is whatever, my back. Like, if you're not working on it, it's not gonna get better. Right. So there's always room for improvement, whether it's mobility, improving mobility of your spine or your ankles or your knees or your hips, or your neck, whatever. You have to work on it. Right. So the bike can't just fix all that. Johnny is an amazing bike fitter, but he can't fix all the problems if you're not doing your due diligence and your, your own stuff. Um, and so that's where I come in to kind of, you know, nag people to do their exercises and whatnot. 
Um, and really it's both. And it's having that good symbiotic relationship. Can you work on yourself and, and maintain good mobility in your, in your joints and, and be active besides just biking, besides just being flexed over on a bike? Can you do other stuff? Um, which is what I work on a lot with people. Um, and then can you have your bike fit in an optimal position to just create efficiency, right? So when we talk about biomechanics, we're really talking about being efficient, right? And that really translates for me into um, less pain. Um, and that's what I see in physical therapy, but it's also just being faster and stronger and, and better on the bike. Um, so it's not just, oh, my knee hurts. I need to get a bike fit or go to PT. It's really, well, I want to be, I want to be faster. I want to be stronger. I want to not have my back feel sore at the top of, I want to be able to ride hundred miles if I want to. Um, and so that's really where we kind of get this interplay between, you know, what is biomechanics and how do we create a more efficient person and then make that bike optimize that efficient person. So it's really the two, the two pieces of the puzzle. And that's, that's kind of where, where I do my stuff and John does, does his stuff. And, and I would ask, or I would suggest to all of you, um, don't give up on yourself, right? The bike fit is, is part of the answer, but there's also, you'd be surprised. There's a lot of stuff that you can do that will improve, you know, um, some of those symptoms of maybe the neck is bothering you or the lower back is bothering you or the knees are bothering you. Um, and a lot of it's just basic strength and mobility, but it has to be stuff away from just biking. And so that's, that's the biggest thing that I tell people is like, there really has to be something where you're doing outside of just cycling, um, as much as I love biking. So that's kind of my little spiel. Um, and we'll get into some specifics. John is really, I'll hand the floor over to him. And we're going to talk about some positions with cleat position, um, really kind of stacking the joints, getting that optimal position on the bike, um, really having that even weight and, and talking about weight displacement in, in terms of your weight into the saddle and into the hands and how that can affect certain things and your three points of contact. Um, and then I think we have a couple of other things, but those are kind of some of the main topics. So cleats, saddle, bars, and maybe like bar width and things like that. So John, I will hand the floor over to you. I know you have a lot to cover. Um, and also again, we have um, our email address as well. I, I don't know we'll get to cover every single question, but I am looking at them right now and, and I will, we will address them as many as we can. Um, but Johnny, take it away. Awesome. Yeah, no, that was a great, um, that was a great intro. And I was reading those questions as well. Um, when uh, they were coming in, those are great questions, a lot of stuff about neck, right. And um, kind of thinking about what you were saying. And you know, one of the first things that I ask most of my or all of my athletes to do is to start taking on some kind of a yoga practice, right, like, right out of the gate, and you know, but get some really macho people. They're like, oh, I don't, I don't like yoga. And it's like, no, no, you're, we'll, we're going to do yoga, and we're going to give you like three percent more performance improvement right there, right? And just, um, you know, which kind of leads into the first thing, which is, you know, we see a lot of things in cycling. We see a lot of um, of people on magazine covers or on the internet. Um, you know, you see Kate Courtney working out, or you see Peter Sagan working out, or Nino, and not everybody are those people, right? Not everybody is going to the Olympics and not everybody should have that kind of position on the bike, right? I think very few people probably can really pedal well in those positions. They're kind of special, they're special people and they work hard on that. They work probably 40 hours a week total, um, 40 to 50 hours a week, right? I mean, you're dealing with that all the time, Dara, right? And, and um, you're, you mean like a more aggressive position is what you mean, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So if they're, if they're trying to get, if you're getting an athlete that is really, you know, riding a super aggressive position, they're, they're putting in a ton of time to stay that flexible and to, to effectively and efficiently pedal the bike like that, right? Which most of us in the real world don't have that much time. So we definitely have to have some, some self-care with that, right? So one thing I think that I really want to, um, I want to emphasize is, when we're out riding is really get in touch with your, get in touch with your body and get in touch with how, um, how, what's going on there, right? And so it's some, just some basic self-assessment. And I see a lot of people in the studio, in the fitting studio that really aren't very in touch with what's happening when they're riding their bike, right? And not, and you know, like they're saying, well, I just have this pain and I just, 
I don't know. I just, and we really have to drill down and we really have to unpack that to get to a place. Um, and you know, a lot of this stuff we can do at home. And so I think, you know, that's, this is a big part of it is so even if you can't solve it on your own, you end up going to a fitter, you end up going to PT and dealing with all this stuff. Um, you have a better idea. You have a clear idea of what, what you're actually, what your issue is or a much clearer idea, right? So, you know, can you squat deeply? Can you squat all the way down with no pain? And when you do that, what happens with your feet and what happens with your knees, right? Completely off the bike, but that always will transfer onto how you are pedaling the bike, right? And if you do that in front of Darai, we are going to see a whole bunch of things in that, right? Um, can you stand on one foot, right? Can you balance with a bare foot? And then can you maybe just do a little squat, right? I'm moving down about six inches and kind of watch what's happening there. Watch what's happening with your knee. Watch what's hap watch what is happening with your foot. Um, you know, it's really important, right? Start thinking about how could I support that better maybe, or, you know, what's happening there. Um, one thing that I really like to do is when I'm watching people um, just walk around in the studio and I have them stop for a second is what stance and, and how do they like to hold their feet, right? It's not very, everybody is kind of individual with that. Everybody, we have these, you know, different hips and different ways that we kind of like to stand. And all this stuff will kind of transfer to what you want to do on the bike because, you know, we, we really want to fit the bike to you, not the other way around, if that makes sense, right? That's really important. So if you have your right foot sticks out five degrees, I'm going to want to rotate the cleat in five degrees so that it's more comfortable because that's the way your foot is going to want to go anyway, right? Yeah, and I think part of, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, I think part of what you're alluding to is, um, you know, what you do and what I do is we're doing like an assessment. So, so you don't need to be a doctor of physical therapy to kind of do some self assessments. And really Johnny's talking about, um, a deep squat. Can you do a deep squat? If you do, what happens? Can you do a deep squat with your arms overhead? And what happens? Um, can you do a single leg squat and what happens side to side? And that actually answers two of those questions because one of them is, regarding the neck, not to, not to side sidetrack a little bit, when your upper back is really tight and stiff and rounded, and then you look up, you're straining your neck, right? So a lot of what we're looking at when people squat with the arms overhead is what's happening with their arms, what's happening with their back. That, that tells me a lot about, okay, well, where are you tight? It may not be the neck that's really the, the tight spot. It may be your middle back, right? Maybe the shoulders rounded forward. So a lot of times when people are having that pain in the neck, because they're looking up there in the drops or that are on descents, it's really telling me that there's something else that's not getting addressed. So you could you can change your bike fit as much as you want, but you're missing the issue, which is more of that mid-back rounding, right? And the other part with the saddle sore is really Johnny's question about like single leg squat. A lot of times you'll notice people have a have an asymmetry side to side, whether that's structural, functional, one one hip is sitting higher and you'll often notice a saddle sore on one side because that pelvis is not sitting level right so this is where if you do your squat you do your single leg squat you would probably see both of those things and i would see those with people if i'm assessing them so that's where even if you don't see me if you were to video yourself you might pick out some of these things and it may tell you some info um back back to you back to you johnny <laughs> Yeah, I, Dara and I went to a great conference this uh, this winter where um, they brought up, um, you know, if you ask a bike fitter and a PT in the same room and you say, yeah, there's there's this rider and they're kind of hurt, they have this or that, which which do you fix first? Do you fix the bike or do you fix the body, right? And the bike fitter is always going to say, well, we'll fix the bike and we'll just work around the body. And the, and the PT is always going to say, we're going to fix the body and that's going to get them in a better place on the bike, right? So we kind of come in from these two different sides, but you know, it's kind of going to the same place, which is we want you to be, we do want both. you to be pain free. Yeah, yeah, do both. I don't care. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I would say, yeah, that's really good. And, you know, one more is if you, I, I have riders doing this, they kind of sit on the table and clasp their hands like this and just turn a little like this and just see what happens with that, you know, and that's, 
it's interesting sometimes. I know um, I had some issues. I broke my back in a crash on Pinehurst a few years ago, and I couldn't turn more than probably five degrees for the longest time. And this is a guy that could, you know, peek under his shoulder and do all that stuff right in the middle of a track race. So yeah. um, it's really difficult. So getting that mobility back and, um, you know, that can really affect what we do. Yeah. Um, and you were going to talk about uh, just kind of set up from the bottom up. So are you going to, how are you going to break it down? Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. am. Um, yeah. So definitely think about being self-aware. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, um, think about what pains you're getting when you're riding, um, what rides kind of rides are causing them. Are they rides with a lot of climbing? Why is that maybe, why is that bothering your lower back? I would say that's a pretty classic one. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have a slide that shows almost everybody is doing this with devices all day long. And then we're typing like this all day long. And then we get on a bike and we do this. Right. right. And we wonder why things are hurting in our neck or, or, um, or our back. Right. And this is, I know you see this in really young athletes and I do too. I see it in my, my kids. Um, you know, 12 year old kids are like my neck hurts and my back hurts. Right. So it's, it's just a lot of overuse. So yeah. think about what position you are in when that pain comes around and kind of what's happening. So just as a real quick example, think about which position your hips are in when mm -hmm. you're climbing and are you rolling your pelvis underneath you or are you tilting it back? And we're going to get into that a little bit, but I just wanted to kind yeah. of, kind of go well, to that. And I think that just kind of goes back to the idea of, you know, we have to do stuff besides just biking. Um, and because most of the clients that I see in patients are cyclists, um, I know how challenging it is to get cyclists to not just ride their bike. Um, but it is not enough. It is not enough for bone density. It's not enough for muscle mass as we get older. It's not enough for preventing injury. It is so sagittal plane, meaning one plane only. You are only in this direction. That is not going to be a long-term. It's going to keep your cardiovascular system strong, um, but it's not enough. And so really the, the things that I try to tell people is that um, you've got to, whether it's yoga, as John suggested, whether it's just some other home program, some online Zoom workout that you enjoy. Um, I'm not even that picky. Like I really just am pretty adamant that people really need to do stuff besides just be on the bike. Even if it's only two or three times a week, some 20 to 30 minute strength and conditioning and mobility program. Um, Patrick, I see your question. We'll get to that one in a second too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we're going to start talking about little things you can do or things you can do that will get you to a, a decent place, at least on the bike. A lot of times this solves a lot of, of beginning riders problems, or they just kind of reset and, and, you know, it's not going to get you in a lot of trouble. So, you know, we're going to start, as Dara said, we're going to start at the bottom. We're going to talk about a um, little foot model here. Basically, your MTP joints, which are right back here, right? The, the first ones, if you feel on the outsides of your foot, you would feel two bumps, right? On the inside and the outside of your foot bound by the toes. And that's where we want the pedal spindle to line up. So if we were looking at it, we would want the pedal spindle where it's coming out of the crank set to be right in this area, right? And I see cleats sometimes, a lot of people are like, I say, well, how did you come up with that position for your cleats. And they'll say, well, I, I don't know. I just put them on and that they looked good. And then, you know, they're up here by the toes, right? And so, or they're way back here. So a lot of times this is what we would call neutralizing the cleats. And if we think about it with a pedal, it's, I don't know how well you can see. Can mm -hmm. you see it right there, Dara? Mm -hmm. okay. So that's what it would look like if this, if this skeletal foot was sitting on the pedal, right? It's just very simply, we want to get it to that point. So how do we do that? Is we feel the, these points through the shoe. Sorry. Sorry for my beat up shoes. I definitely need to buy some new road shoes. These are my trainer shoes. But we feel through the shoe on either side right there. You'll feel the bumps come out on your foot. Sometimes it's a little tricky, but you can you can probably see there's little marks on the side right there because I've marked my shoes up a bunch of times. And you end up with basically a mark to the front 
in a mark back a little bit and you neutralize that in between the two. As a starting point, you're saying, right? As a starting point. Right. That, that works, I would say, on like 90% of people to 95% of people. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty simple. Um, you know, if you are looking at it from the midline, and I have some stuff, is, uh, we'll send out a PowerPoint, and then we'll send out a, um, a blog post as well, a link to a blog post that has a side view of this on a rider that I shot, and you can really clearly see the spindle, you can see, I just, we use lasers and things like that. So you can see the laser bisecting the middle of the spindle right there. And just basically the, the foot is nicely balanced on that point, right? So it gives you, it gives you a nice platform for your, for your foot to push down on. Right. right? And again, it's a starting, I mean, I think that the point is, if you have no clue where your cleats are, this is a good place to start. If you if you have some specific, you ha you're more for or aft, and that's been intentional. We're not saying that this is the only way, but if you have no clue and you just somebody else threw them on or you just threw them on haphazardly, this is a really good place to start. Is by finding that just start from neutral, and then you can modify as needed. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's definitely um, a kind of a, there, there's a few cases or kind of outlying cases. Typically, it's like track sprinters, um, things like that, where you want to really create a little more lever into the back, a little more stress in the back of the leg and things like that. Um, people that ride in some interesting positions. And some people will like it way back here, right? They even sell a cleat that puts the pedal way back here. But that's really outliers. Get it underneath, the, get it underneath those MTP joints. And the other thing is when we kind of going back to stance a little bit, if you see that one of your feet is goes out or in a little bit, mostly out, in I would be a little more concerned about, but they typically will turn out. Think about, and especially if you have any knee pain around that, think about maybe tilting that cleat in a couple degrees, right? So you can kind of see there's little marks like in the front of this completely battered shoe right here. And Basically, you just get some little reference marks and just try it. Just turn it just a little tiny bit um, and see if that resolves a problem. Because a lot of times that can really help kind of get the, get the cleat as you're pedaling to move back and forth in this float that they build into most, into most cleats now, right? So you have a few degrees there, but sometimes, if, especially if your foot is loaded to one side or the other, it's going to be pushing against that all the time. And that's going to create some pain on generally on the outside of the knee is where I, I see it. Does that make any yep. sense? That makes sense. Okay. <laughs> all right. So um, that's kind of where we want to go with the feet. And then the next thing we really want to start thinking about is a concept of kind of stacking the joints, right? So um, really think about you can do this, you can video yourself, you can ride in front of a mirror. Um, the same thing comes as you start to assess, but think about stacking, stacking the joints all the way up your body when you're sitting on the bike. So if you were to come into Dara and I's studio, we would put a couple, I would put a couple lasers at kind of facing at your, at the second ray of the toe right there. And then with that laser would go up through your knee, that laser, or go through your ankle, through your knee, through the iliac crest, and through the AC joint, so all the way up to here. So it really, in most bodies, it pretty much stacks up pretty nicely. And mm -hmm. we want to think about if something's not aligned there, what's happening, right? And and we'll might... see that, yeah, we'll see that as well with the squat, right? So if I'm assessing somebody in their deep squat and I get a frontal view of them, I don't need a laser, although Johnny's is much more specific, but you'll see you know, if one foot is turned this way or the knee is going this way. And, and like, in general, I want, I want to see the kneecap lining up along with about the third, second and third toes. Right. And when I see that going off to one way, it's going to be probably this exact same thing you see on the bike. So that's where what I'm seeing often reflects what Johnny's seeing or what, if you were to video yourself, or if you were to video yourself biking, or even just doing your own squat assessment, you'll, you'll pick up on a lot of these things and it'll tell you and it doesn't and and a i would i would fit for that but i would also figure out why that's happening and can you fix that right it just doesn't mean oh my knee just goes out to the side and it's all wonky and forget about it, it means why is that happening is that something that i can work on especially if you have pain right if you just naturally are 
toed out and you have zero pain and you're feeling great and fine, I'm, I don't really care about that. If you have one foot that's out and you have a ton of pain, then I care. And then I want to assess that and, and possibly correct that. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think it's, it's really easy one to assess, right? Pretty much everybody has a trainer, just ride in front of a mirror or set up a camera, video yourself a little bit riding. And you will see, you'll see, like you said, little things like the knee will pop out. Generally, the knee is kind of the telltale. It's kind of the canary in the coal mine with the whole thing because your, your ankle can move different ways and your hip can move different ways, but your knee doesn't really like to move different ways, right? Generally, when our knees move, sideways, they don't like that very much, right? So the knee is going to do something and, and that's where you're going to see it, yeah. right? It's some part of the stroke, the body's going to be trying to get around something. And so that's why this is such a great way to, to kind of self-assess what's happening there, right? Um, yeah, so we want to talk about balance fore and aft, right? Super big one. Um, how much weight on the hands should we have? Um, I like to have, especially with road riders or well, really almost with anybody, I like to have the hands be pretty light. So if we think about the percentage of weight between our hands and our butt, I like to have the hands, it, generally if there's a sensation that there's a lot of pressure on the hands, the hands are gonna go numb, um, you're gonna get tired, um, you know, you're gonna be, you're just gonna be tired from holding yourself up in those situations. Um, so you know, figuring out what's happening there, again, is a lot of self-assessment, um, you know, um, yeah. So I can talk about this a little more because this gets kind of into a little bit, saddle setback is kind of like a crazy thing that bike fitters are like, whoa, I don't know if I even want to talk about saddle setback because it, so every time you move something on the position, something else changes, right? But Something to think about on the saddle is, and this kind of comes back to climbing again, is how much is this pelvis rolling back like this when we're climbing in the saddle? How much is this rolling underneath our bodies? And how much, or if we're a more aggressive rider, how much, because we talk a lot about these sit bones, right? We talk a lot about them and we talk a lot about saddle width and things like that. But if we're a really aggressive rider, that's, that rider is actually going to be way more up on the, on the pubic rhema, right? They're going to be up a little more on that. So it's really a whole other thing that's happening. We're not sitting back on some, some bones back there, right? So something to really think about. And if you have back pain with that, one thing that I like to really coach riders up about, because I see this a lot, I see a lot of posterior tilt in riders just kind of riding around. And what that transfers into is a kind of a curve in the lower back, right? Is I like to ask them to just kind of pull their hips back. Like if somebody was grabbing their hips while they were pedaling and just kind of pulling them back a little bit and coaching them to just get a little bit of anterior tilt in the pelvis. Um, and a lot of times that can just relieve a lot of pressure right there. Um, and I, I, th I think that also goes back to um, working on your mobility, right, off of the bike. So when you see a person who's incredibly flexed, even if their spine is a little stiff, right, when you're stuck into that flexed position over onto the bike, you're putting a lot of stress into the lower back and you're not really using, again, we get back to biomechanics and levers, you're not really using that hip to hinge very well. So your back is doing all the work. So if you have a little bit more of what Johnny said as an anterior tilt, or maybe just even a, a little bit more of a flatter back and you're not as rounded, you're not, here, that's better. You're not going to be stressing out your lower back. If, imagine if this is my lower back. So there needs to be a little bit more of this idea of this hip hinging and my glutes, which are my big movers, really creating power from this hip hinge. Again, this is just physics, biomechanics, so that my back is not doing all the work, right? Um, and that goes along with Patrick's question. And I think a lot of people where they get lower back fatigue, um, or their form starts to get fiddly funky at the end of harder efforts. And you don't really see it with the bike fit. Um, and my, my part of my answer to that, which isn't quite answering his question is part of my answer to that is 
you know, when fatigue sets in, um, that's where all the strength and conditioning and mobility work that you've done off the bike is going to help you, right? So riding for a thousand miles is not really what's going to get you to the finish line. It's all the work that you did when your body is fatigued, where that muscular endurance and that flexibility and mobility, that's what's going to help you at the end of those hard efforts. That's what's holding you. That's what's holding Peter Sagan in place because of all the strength training that he does, which is a tremendous amount of work. Um, and, and that's really ideally what's going to hold all of us when we get into our endurance rides at the end of the ride where our back is not hurting and our neck is not hurting is it's not just biking, right? Things are falling apart because we can't just bike, right? There has to be something else to support us in a good optimal position. And that optimal position really needs to come from you working on you and not just expecting the bike to hold you up for a hundred miles. Um, so that's part, that's part of my little deal with, you know, um, getting into longer mileage and what happens with the lower back, but really also that idea of that hip hinge, right? And that's, that's really what you will find when you work on a squat or a deadlift um, or, or even a bridge exercise at home is you'll be able to work on that position or even some hip stretches um, or, you know, knee to chest stretches. That's really what you want to work on so that you're not rounding and sitting on your tailbone almost, right? And straining your lower back um, and finding that really comfortable, unweighted saddle position, right? Should feel comfortable by the end of your ride. Shouldn't feel like your, your butt's hurting or your groin is hurting or your numbness or whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I do pretty much uh, most of the strength training that I do with athletes is all around making them more durable. It's really not about creating more force on the bike. We talk about this a lot. We're like, oh, I'm more powerful on the bike or this or that. You don't really create a lot of force when you're pedaling a bike so much. It's really that your, your form doesn't fall apart and that you can withstand crashes and things like that. And um, that's a great question about riding up Diablo. Um, and uh, yeah, I could, I could go into telling stories about um, taking up running again and watching my posterior chain just fall apart at like 20 minutes. And then I would train a little more and it was like 30 minutes. And, you know, before you know, you're at a couple hours. Yeah. Um, one thing, one thing that I use for, for riders that are having those issues, and this goes all the way, this goes to like even riding on the track with hard efforts is I use a Leomo system, which is completely portable, um, put sensors on that person and we go out and do efforts outdoors. So I like to do a fit indoors um, really dial that in. And there's ways you can turn that up to an extent. I mean, if you want to have somebody do an hour long effort, that's a long time, honestly, in a bike fit to do a threshold effort, but you can turn up the resistance for sure and see what's happening in that rider. And then taking them outside and having them do some hard efforts as well. Um, anyway, that system is completely portable. And I, I like to see basically the same, same behavior in a human whether they're inside or outside, right? And of course, there's gonna be changes. Um, you know, just, just to point out, I mean, just on a saddle alone, if you're climbing and you're climbing at, let, let's say like about, you know, a 10 degree hill or something like that, well, you're, you're going to move somewhere on that saddle, right? You're either gonna move up or you're gonna move back. Or if you're riding really hard, and you're what they call getting on the rivet, that's no joke, right? You're going to move up more on that saddle. So kind of taking this stuff into account, like, well, what kind of rider are you? What kind of racer are you? Are you somebody that's, you know, are you riding criteriums for an hour and a pro one, two criterium, you're gonna ride like that for an hour, just full gas. And if you're riding around in the, in the hills, you could probably relax and be much farther back on this part of the saddle. Right, so kind of thinking about what's um, what's happening there is important. Um, I'll tell a little story about um, people getting tired and how quickly that happens. Um, I have an athlete that um, she's a national champion on the track, specializes in the 2K pursuit, so that's like about a three-minute effort, um, so not very long. Um, and when I take her to the track and we put the Leoma system on her, we see every time through a turn. We see little hops. And if I put a sensor on the back of her helmet, I see her pick her head up every lap. And she knows she's not supposed to do it. 
and it's still you could never see that you'd have to shoot the best video you'd have to have some amazing camera system honestly to really break that down even at the track and see that but it, they will just pick it up just like this right so then we can go back and go well, what's happening there what what happened with your head you know and it's just basically she wants to peek through the turn right so yeah figuring out why you're doing that stuff or just getting basically like dara said stronger will help with all this stuff. And that's where you're gonna see the strength work really pay off, is in the last 20 minutes of Diablo. Juniper to the top, that's where you're gonna see the effort, where it's where you're gonna see it pay off. Yeah, I mean, I remember ta I remember reading an article with, um, not to keep talking about Peter Sagan, but with his strength and conditioning coach saying, um, like that's why he's, you know, so strong, maybe not, this was actually two years ago, is really, you know, building, building, building so much strength work um, in the off season so that through an entire road season, you don't fall apart. Um, and again, none of us are racing pro here not that I know of. Um, but the same thing applies is that you really want to fortify your body um, at the end of your 30 mile ride, 40 mile ride, 100 mile ride, 200 mile ride, whatever. Um, and, and there's a lot of value in that. And I think it's only recently that us cyclists, um, especially road cyclists, have really realized um and appreciated that not only if you crash you need some muscle mass otherwise you're going to break something um but also you need better bone density like cycling is not helping you at all with bone density and that's that's a real issue for women and for us as we get older um i saw a couple questions about some off you know um cross training ideas um I think all of those suggested are great. Um, it's nice to do some loading. So as much as I love swimming, and I do think there's some really amazing things that you get out of swimming, core strength, upper body strength, some extension, so you're not flexed, um, you're not loading, right? So again, you know, you have to do some stuff, whether it's um, strength training, um, yoga would be okay, you're doing some loading stuff. I think, I think all of those are great. Um, and also it has to be something that's meaningful to you. And that's that like, you know, like some people just don't want to run or they can't run. Um, some people hate yoga. Like Johnny was saying, some people have no access to the pool. Um, everybody can do some body weight exercises at home. Right. And that's a lot of what the programs that I do are body weight resistance bands, maybe some free weights or kettlebells. Like you have, you have everything you need at home. You, you don't need anything. Um, so they're all, they're all great. It's, I think the bigger issue is what, what can you commit to, you know, maybe two to three times a week and, and what really, what do you enjoy doing? I mean, maybe we'll never get everybody to enjoy um, the stuff besides cycling, but what do you, what do you hate the least? <laughs> what, what do you hate the least? What can we convince you? What can I convince you to do? <laughs> Doesn't need to be my program, but do the other thing, whatever that is. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a lot of people, um, a lot of my guys right now, uh, hiking. Yeah. And I, I love it. I love it personally. I mean, I, I loved, I did some longer backpacking trips this summer. I had a great time with it. Um, but, you know, I, I just get up, just get out and do some, do some hiking and you're getting a lot of, you know, maybe it's not, it's definitely not as impactful as running, um, luckily. Um, but you can definitely get some great different loading happening as Dara was saying, and yeah. that will really strengthen your whole body. And, you know, East Bay is fantastic for, yeah. for hiking. Yeah. I mean, as long as you're getting something that's off of the bike, that's not just working in that sagittal plane motion, which is that same one dimensional cycling, like our, our muscles, our joints really need strength 360 degrees around. So if you're only working quads, you know, like in this direction only, um, that's, that's not really enough to have a supple, healthy joint. Um, it's good for your cardiovascular system and it, and it's, it's good compared to the rest of the people in the U S but we don't want to just be as good. We want to be not having pain and feeling great and riding our bikes forever. So, um, yeah. So I want to get back to, I want to get back to the last kind of part of that, which is handlebar. I want to talk about hand position a little bit, um, and because we kind of we kind of got up through the hips, and we kind of talked a little about saddle. We could probably talk about saddles for an hour alone, but um, talking a little about 
hand position and shoulder position and things like that. Um, some things I like to do, um, I like to see people when they come into my office, they come in, I just have them do kind of a push up against the wall, just, just like kind of like that. And I see where they like to put their hands. Mm. And this comes back to kind of like what, you know, we'll, we will look and we'll measure your shoulders across, but, and that's a good starting point. Um, I would, but I also like to just see where you like to put your hands. And I want, what you can do as part of this is really, especially if you're having any hand issues, is really watch what's happening with your hands and see, see if the wrists are neutral. Um, I was just having a conversation with a rider earlier um, because you know he was saying that like he doesn't like this kind of grip. I don't know if anybody has this kind with kind of the wing on it, if you can see that right there. Mm -hmm. um, that wing, um, I, I have these on several bikes and I can't stand them now. Like I, there's something that's bothering me right here and I have about four other riders that are bothering me. And it's like, I play with it and I try and turn them different ways. And um, I don't really care for that so much. Um, but think about really how wide a bar you wanna ride, right? And this comes to mountain biking, but also into road cycling is, are the wrists nice and nice and neutral? Or are they getting put into some kind of twisted, position going if you're on a mountain bike uh dara and i saw a guy about six months ago he was riding a bar that was kind of swept back it was swept back about 35 degrees probably about like that looking at the little pro protractor there um and that was turning his wrists like this the whole time he was riding he had like a townie bike right and he was wondering why his elbows were hurting and his hands were hurting and his wrists were hurting. And I told him, go get a basically a straight bar or a bar with very little setback and get that back to get that back to a good place. So you have to kind of think about that. These are very small things. Are you reaching for the controls? I see this so much where people come in, the bike is a little too big and the bars are a little bit too big or the controls simply aren't adjusted correctly for the size of hands. That the rider is riding there, there's a there is a adjustment on pretty much every modern bicycle now to bring in the control levers a little bit um you just pretty much go on youtube now and, and look at youtube's for everything right so um you know and figure out how to move those in a little bit and or, or out a little bit and get that just right for you and you can't really mess that up they're you know they have a bunch of safeties in there so you're not going to get hurt you're not really loosening the controls you're just moving them in a little bit or out a little bit they still yeah. work the same I've, I've had to do that myself because i'm pretty small um moving the levers in i know um that can also bother the neck you know neck issues from just the hood placement or where you are on the hoods um, when you're too extended that can create that neck stress um, so there's there's definitely value in fixing the the cockpit setup and i've modified my my levers and everything. So it brings it much closer to me because I just have small, it's hard for me to reach, right? But it, it, that's a pretty easy fix. So um, I've changed yeah. it on all my bikes. It, it is, it is. I mean, a lot of times I see uh, petite people riding like 42 centimeter bars, right? That would probably be, it's just to kind of throw a number out there and or 44s even. And it's amazing what happens when you put them on a 36 or a 38. And now we're stacking this joint again, right? Now it's perfect. And it, this does get back into the next stuff. So the, probably the next, the last one we wanna talk about is what's your ideal torso angle, right? And you really have to figure, figure that out um, because if, you're, if you are racing um, you know, for two minutes, your torso angle is likely to be very different than if you're racing for or riding for two hours or you know several days or whatever. You know, I mean, people do all kinds of crazy stuff, right? I know probably a few people have seen the the Ram people that have the the little brace that they'll tape to their heads right there, and they'll ride for days because their necks get sore, and so they'll literally tape a piece of you know. So let's let's not do anything like that, right? <laughs> We're not. <laughs> <laughs> that's commitment, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah, but 
it's an interesting thing because we get a lot of marketing and especially if you come from a racing background or and especially a racing background from 15 or 20 years ago um, a lot of those a lot of those images and a lot of the ways we fit bikes back then were very low um, very stretched over slam the stem right that's a whole thing um, and a lot of times that's not going to even give you the best performance right the best performance is when your hip angle is not closed down enough. Um, so when your torso, if you're if you if you start if this is the bottom if this is a vertical line and your torso starts going over more like this, I'll try and get a little better perspective. So if your torso starts going over too much, it's going to close that hip angle down too much, and your power is going to drop dramatically off. So we want to find a good space for that. The, you can gain much more aerodynamics typically by what happens with your head. If you're actually thinking about that, if you're actually playing in that part of the game, to think about what's happening with your head as opposed to how low your stem is and how low the front of your body is. There's way more aerodynamic gain to be made in a, in a helmet and what you're doing with your head position um, than that. And that's, again, that's in the performance space as opposed to the comfort space, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So we had questions. I think we have, I think we've answered most of the questions. I know, I know specifically, I do get a lot of stuff with saddle sores, um, knee pain on one side. I mean, um, the neck issue, uh, a lot of it really comes down to like pelvic alignment. And, and again, one, one thing that I, that I, I always tell all my patients or clients even is that none of us are symmetrical. So the goal is not to be perfectly symmetrical. There, that does not exist. We are humans. We're totally asymmetrical. That's fine. Um, and it's not really an issue that you have an asymmetry um, unless you're having a lot of pain, right? So if you are having pain or you're always like, oh, I have a saddle sore. My knee always hurts on this side, da, 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 da. That's when you do want to kind of look at those things and then really unpack um, and take a step back and see like, well, what's, what, what is the source of this issue versus, well, my symptom is, I get a saddle sore on the inside of the same leg. My knee always hurts on that side. You're, that's your body's way of just telling you that something's not aligned, right? So that could be in the back, a little stiffness or asymmetry in the back. Could be in the hip and pelvis. Maybe that hip is weaker on that side or it could be the foot and ankle. You had an old ankle injury or something stiff. Um, and so then really it's, that's where you have to do like the sleuthing of kind of figuring out why that's happening. But Again, we all have these normal asymmetries. It's not a huge issue, but if you are having pain, then it, it's often a sign like that something is not being addressed up and down the chain, right? Whether it's the back is tight, um, hips are, are stiff or tight, um, ankles, right? So this just gets, this gets back to the idea of, you know, do your stretches, do, do your mobility work. I call it mobility work, but most people just think of it as stretching or foam rolling. That's all in the same category. Um, and then if you have one side that's weaker, right, which is, which is common, strengthen it, right? So it, you just got to put all the pieces together um, and do some basic, basic strength and mobility work. And that should, should help to kind of create better alignment, right? We're not going for perfect because that doesn't exist, but, but improved alignment because all these things that we feel are really just because cycling is a repetitive sport. So you get these, rep I call all this stuff is repetitive stress injury. Like, just like you think of carpal tunnel, that's what all this is. Cause we're doing this over and over and over and over thousands and thousands of times. You have one little thing that's off in the chain, a little knee or whatever. And that's where you get a repetitive stress injury. So really it's our job to kind of tease out why that's happening. And it's not hard. You just have to spend the time to really assess that and then treat it, right? Which, which is not, again, not hard, but you have to put in the time to do it. Um, we, had, we had a question. We had one question about um, pedal placement, narrow versus wide, um, needing the pedals in a wider position. Tom had another, Tom had a question too. But yeah, did you see that question, Johnny? Yeah, those are, those are great questions. There's like three really good ones there. Um, just dig right in. Um, we'll start with the pedal one because you brought that one up. Oh yeah, I didn't see it there too, yeah. Yeah, a lot of times um, I 
So speed play, if you can get speed play, there's a whole thing if speed play is even happening right now, but um, they have different spindle widths, but something you can do is add spacers onto either side. Um, I have little washers that will take it out two millimeters. And then I have um, spacers that take it out two centimeters because you have to safely add a whole thing there. And what, what they would call that in bike fitting is the V-twin, the classic V-twin. And it's basically when somebody is kind of sticking both their knees out like this, and they're they're going like this. So it looks just like a, a V, like a Harley Davidson going down the road, right? And so if you are able to, if you think about the bottoms of my hands as the feet, if you're able to move this out a little bit, that can bring a lot of happiness to that rider, right? So that's a nice thing to do. If you if you notice. Um, on a spin bike that you're a little happier and then on your road bike you're maybe not feeling so happy that a lot of times can be because the pedals are just a little bit farther out it's just got to do with kind of the structure of the crank all the pedals all pedals pretty much have a as a standard or about 56 millimeters from where they touch the crank to the midline of the pedal so unless you're buying the special spindles or anything they're kind of trying to force everybody into the standard, but we're all different bodies, right? So I think that's a good path to go down. Um, if, you, if you are noticing anything like that, that can be um, a nice thing. Um, you don't see a lot of performance degradation or anything like that. Just be careful, don't put like extra washers, don't put more than one washer in there because you're taking away from how much thread is going into that crank and that's unsafe. Um, and then I think Patrick had a question for you and then Tom had a question about I see one, uh, oh, one leg longer than the other, saddle issues um, on the shorter side. Uh, to my, my, two, my very quick answer to that is everybody has a shorter leg um, and leg length discrepancy. So that is normal for everybody. It's rare. In fact, I would say quite rare in my 15 years of being a PT that I've ever really had to give somebody an insert or a shim because of it. More than More often what I see is they have a, structure a functional leg length discrepancy because they have either a, a mild scoliosis in their back which as as our vertebrae degenerate over the years we get uneven wearing down and then the pelvis shifts so you have one hip sitting higher and that creates that leg length discrepancy and that's just normal with age for most of us um because we're human uh or it's a functional leg length discrepancy because your butt and glute on one side is just not as strong so you have a hip drop Right. So I would, I would probably suggest looking up the chain because again, several millimeters, even quite a few millimeters of difference is, is normal and should be completely asymptomatic. So if you are having issues, it's more than likely um, a functional leg length discrepancy caused by something above. And if you fix that, you won't have the other stuff lower. Um, Johnny, you're, you were yeah, I would, I would, I would agree with that. And you know, I'm, I am not a doctor in physical therapy. Um, the what I do is when somebody contacts me and they say I have a leg length discrepancy, I say I ask them, is that a, um, is it diagnosed? Is it measured? Do you have a, you know, has has somebody looked at you with an X-ray and said yes, it's off for this much? And um, I do see people that have. Um, motorcycles. Motorcycle accidents are bad for getting things compressed and damaged and um, and the ankle and things like that. Um, so the, the, the stock answer is you would shim for half the length on the other side. Most of the time, like Dara said, I would say, I don't know, 90% of the time, 95% of the time probably, it's something that you can work out um, with PT. And that's where I would typically guide people or, or we do a treatment plan where there's something in there. Okay. That feels better. And then we work with treatment at the same time yeah. to get you to a place where you probably don't need a shim in your shoe. Yeah. And, right? and we've there's done, we've done that ourselves, worked with people where we shim and then they work on their PT stuff and then they do less shim and it's, there's definitely a balance. Yeah. 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 It definitely, it definitely moves around and um, you know, you want to, I mean, it's, it's not, you know, if it happens, it happens. Um, Patrick had one more, I think we're, we need to wrap it up, but Patrick had a question about oh, raising the saddle. Yeah. Um, yeah. As far as raising the saddle, uh, again, this is kind of self-assessment. 
right? Um, so if you, I like to raise saddles until I start to see the, the back of the pelvis back here. If we put a couple dots on that and my little lasers are going and I have a sensor right here, when the, when the hips start to rock a little bit too much like this, I'm gonna wanna bring you back down a little bit. Um, if you are feeling a sensation of a lot of pressure in the saddle, sometimes that can be too high. If you're feeling typically, and these are kind of ballpark answers, but if you're, if you're coming to me and you're saying, I have a lot of uh, pressure in my quadriceps, right? I'm kind of like, I'm pushing a lot, probably gonna pay, raise your saddle up a little bit. If your knee is popping out, we're probably gonna raise your saddle a little bit, right? Just because if you're having too much pressure and you're closing your hip angle, you know, any of that stuff happening, um, you know, and it, again, this depends on what kind of biking you're doing, what kind of cycling you're doing. Um, it depends how, you know, if you're on a track bike, I'm going to lower your saddle probably. I'm going to, because I want you to make a really nice pedal stroke um, oh. with a lot of power, but we're not riding for efficiency at that stage. We're riding for just pure power. Yeah. So um, I hope that answers that. That's a, like a big, big question, but it's a great way to kind of pull apart, especially if, yeah, yeah. I think a lot of people could raise their saddle a little bit for sure. I think um, so. John has a has a PowerPoint recap that we can send out to, to all of you if you have more questions and and a, and a nice article kind of delineating, delineating everything we talked about with cleat, um, some of the basics of just basic setup. Um, if you have if if any of you have any more questions um, for either of us, please feel free to reach out. Use us as a resource. Um, I know times are really hard right now because you can't go to the bike bike shops like you normally would or or just hang out and get fit and all these things. So um, please use us as a resource and um, any, any questions you have, we're here, we're here for you guys, um, guys and gals. Yes, thank you. All right, um, yes, thank you John and Dara for those awesome, awesome presentation. I, we already have Dara's information, but um, Johnny, how do, we, how do we reach you? Do you have a preference? Um, I can put it in the chat or I can uh, send it to you with the things that, with the follow-up things, um, with the follow-up okay. links, there's, that's one of them's to my blog. So you can definitely, it's to my company blog. I'm, I'm easy to Perfect. find. It's, you know, tempo endurance. So <laughs> pretty simple. Okay. Okay. Great. So, um, thank you both. I did post the survey and the link uh, or in the chat, please fill it out. Um, I will, based on the feedback, I will also ask the um, presenters if they want to see the feedback. Maybe it'll be helpful for them for their future presentations. But it's just, it's just super helpful for us to get feedback so we can make sure um, our members' needs are being met as far as what they want to hear about, who they want to see speaking. On that note, our next speech is going to be, our next program is going to be on Monday, January 11th. At uh, same time, um, a different link, so please check your emails or your Wheel Truth. But it's um, two women, Kemi King and Denise Edwards, who summited Everested Mount Tam. Um, so they rode Mount Tam enough times to cover 157 miles and over 29,000 feet. And I heard they did it for fun. So, <laughs> uh, I think that's all. I think that's it. This is, I'm going to end the recording. It'll be available online over the next few days with the notes from uh, Coach Johnny and Dara. Thank you, guys. Be safe. Happy holidays. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having me.